Welcome to We Do the Heavy Lifting. I'm your host, Dr. Jenny Yentis, and today we do fiber. Fiber is something we get told all the time that we're supposed to eat, but what is it in other than maybe bread? And does it actually help us lose weight? Our expert today is Dr. Mark Ferris from Texas A&M University. He's an associate professor there and an extension specialist. And he has his own blog called fitnesspudding.com, correct? And he busts the wildest myths about weight loss, food, all kinds of things. So today, let's talk about fiber. So, but first of all, I want to know, how'd you get into myth busting? Yeah, so one, it's great to be here. Um, and I've enjoyed the conversations even before the camera started rolling. So I got into this probably, if I had to look back on it, was when I was in the fitness industry in my early 20s. And it was really all the different claims that people were making. Mm -hmm. Not only people, but products, supplements, uh, exercise equipment, fad diets. And they were incompatible. In other words, uh, one had to be right. They both couldn't be right in the yes. same universe. Mm -hmm. And that really bugged me. It affected my ability to educate th those that I was working with who deserved and wanted an answer. Also, though, I started seeing how it affected their behavior. So, uh, it, you know, you, you only can do so many fad diets unsuccessfully to not start thinking about, you know, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe this won't work for me. Start affecting confidence. And then when the new behavior comes around, uh, you know, eating fruits and vegetables or something like, oh, you know what? I've already tried healthy eating. It <laughs> doesn't work for me. I'm like, no, you tried, <laughs> you tried that. That didn't work. Or, you know, they did some uh, vigorous exercise routine mm -hmm. and it hurt them. They're like, you know what? Exercise hurts me. Like, no, that, that one did. So human nature is to globalize some of these things. Uh, we protect self-esteem. We catastrophize at time. In short, I became so intrigued with that and those concerns. It actually is what led me back to get my master's degree in exercise physiology with an emphasis in nutritional science because I wanted to know mm -hmm. who's right. There was something that happened during that time, uh, real quick, was I was in one of our labs doing, collecting some data. We were waiting on, on participants. And I picked up a, uh, like a fitness magazine. And it had, this was back when core training was becoming pretty yes, popular, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a person doing a prone bridge, bows and toes as they call it, on their <laughs> elbows. And, and so they're holding it and it said core strengthening exercise. And I didn't think anything about it. I was just reading. I, I kind of had an interest in that. And then later that night, same day, no lie, I was in a different lab, biochem lab, uh, working with a buddy on doing some assays and uh, picked up another fitness magazine. And I went and had another core section because it was so popular. Same exercise, and they said uh, core stabilizing. Mm. And I'm like, it can't be both. Yeah. We train differently, at least in what my understanding was. I train for strength or I train for stability. What ended up happening, the long story short, was that led, I wrote an entire review article called Core Training, Stabilizing the Confusion. And that was my first publication as a, a graduate student. Um, and I reviewed hundreds of articles, and I started getting sort of a taste of, wow, it's pretty difficult to, you say, bust a myth. Well, how do you even do that? How, where do I go to determine what's yeah. right and what's wrong? Fast forward to uh, starting my PhD in behavioral medicine, which we look at uh, not only behavior, how it increases or decreases risk of mm -hmm. disease, disability, premature death, but also the psychology related to that. So I sort of came full circle in the, the psychophysiological aspects of health behavior, difficulties of adopting. And I kept getting the same questions over and over, <laughs> such as fiber and weight loss, as yeah. we'll talk about today. So I started the blog, fitnesspudding.com, and now I teach a class, and I have for years, in teaching students how to bust myths, so to speak, because um, I have discovered that, and I did this too, admittingly, Many professionals perpetuate myths. Yes. And so that started yes. bugging me. And on a serious note, it was like, well, how can we teach evidence-based practice, reading research, finding it, understanding it, in sort of a fun way, using myths. But at the same time, because the impact it can have, negative impact it can have on people and their adoption of healthy lifestyles, it becomes quite, quite significant. Well, I'm sure a lot of our listeners would be interested in that class. So in the show notes, we will be sure okay, to cool. add right um, some information about your class. So if anybody's interested, check the show notes. Yes. So let's get on for the top or let's get on to the topic for today. Fiber. What is it and why do we need it? Yeah. So 
uh, we definitely hear a lot about it. Mm -hmm. um, fiber, generally speaking, dietary fiber is a substance in plants that we can eat. There's largely two types. There's soluble, which it's a type of fiber that, I mean, simply put, dissolves in water. Okay. And it becomes like this gel like substance that just sort of eats <laughs> through your intestines and there's a ton Sounds of benefits lovely. it does but believe it or not there's tons of benefits to that which we can maybe talk about um, insoluble fiber doesn't dissolve in water okay so it just sort of bulks okay the the stool it's a regular regularity preventing constipation there's benefits to that too and so the the general standpoint of needing it and why do we need it is we're meant to eat foods that are typically high in fiber, vegetables, fruits, mm -hmm. whole grains. And in eating those, the soluble fiber, uh, the tremendous health benefits that come from that, largely related to that, sl that eking <laughs> through the intestines, <laughs> it slows things down so that we can absorb. It sucks in like fat, cholesterol, uh, glucose, sugar. And so the, the release into the bloodstream is not as fast. Okay. Thus, everything that would happen after that, such as how the hormones respond, um, the most probably basic example that we probably heard the most is if I just eat a, a bunch of sugar right now, the pancreas would have to release a ton of mm -hmm. insulin to try to get that into the muscle or store it or whatever it would have to do. But if that, that same amount of sugar is combined with fiber, it's a much slower release. And so the insulin doesn't have to spike. And so when we talk about health and insulin sensitivity and terms like that, fiber has a great benefit there. The other big area is, uh, simply put again, it feeds the microbiome, the good bacteria of the gut. And uh, the, the bacteria feed off that, it ferments, and it produces all sorts of good things. One of those is a, a short-chain fatty acid. And that has tremendous benefits on neurological benefits, uh, pr reducing inflammation, mm -hmm. Uh, it, uh, preventing cell death, and also hormones, estrogen and androgen, which are related to cancer. So we hear a lot of fiber in prevention of colon cancer and other cancers. We hear it a lot associated with heart disease. You can see like the whole grain mm -hmm. cereals, they'll throw it on that, uh, prevent heart disease because of the, the fiber that's in those, those whole grains. So the, the most of the time, the benefit that we talk about when it comes to fiber is those health benefits, uh, mental and physical when it comes to supplementation and the uh, glucomannan or glucomannan mm -hmm. that we'll talk about today, it's not always about those health benefits. There are other reasons that fiber might be uh, promoted. So you brought it up, uh, glucomannan, um, it's a type of fiber that's mm -hmm. being marketed right now as yeah. a weight loss or mm -hmm. will help a, a skinny fiber, right, <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. So um, can you tell us a little bit about the what it is and the claims that are being made? Yeah, so... Glucomannan or glucomannan, uh, glucomannan, I think I've heard it said. Hey, um, potato, potato. It, it is, <laughs> and it's actually a yam. Yeah, it's, a, it's called the elephant yam. It's the konjac root. It's okay. out of Asia. Um, and just think of it like a sweet potato mm -hmm. yam looking uh, vegetable. Well, the glucomannan is the fiber in that. It, it is soluble, so it is one of that, that type of fiber that produces that gel-like. So yeah, this got really popular because um, years ago, like uh, mid 2000s maybe, you would see videos, they would put uh, glucoman in powder and then okay. pour water in and it would just expand like 50% more, like hu this huge expansion. Yeah. Then they're like, oh, can you imagine that in your gut? <laughs> and then, you know, how hungry would you be if you put this in there? True. Anyway, True. it's natural fiber from a natural mm -hmm. product. And yes, you're right, it was uh, marketed as many fiber supplements are, by the way, you take something that's natural from a natural source, like this yam, elephant yam, and then you create a supplement from it, and then you sell that supplement in some dosage. Uh, I believe this, this, this fiber is usually around four or five grams per day, okay. um, which is an apple, Okay. right? If you're kind of comparing it to food, mm -hmm. uh, half a cup of raspberries or something like that. But the, the claim is yes, if you consume this fiber, the most common claim is about um, filling up. So you, again, you vis visibly can picture this, this huge mass, that yeah. this gel that has worked its way through and just fills up the gut. Thus, I have greater feelings of fullness. Uh, I'm not as hungry. 
so satiety is involved. Thus, I would eat less, mm -hmm. so my caloric intake could go down. Or maybe I don't eat that bad food, so that would be high in yeah. calories and low in nutrition. And subsequently, if you reduce calories, you tend to lose weight. So there's not necessarily anything magical about the fiber and weight. It tends to work through, generally at least, uh, through the reductions in food intake and, and caloric intake. Okay. So in your myth busting of mm -hmm. this particular fiber, what did you find? Did you find that it was actually people were getting those feelings of satiation and not eating as much? Or I mean, were the claims that were being made I guess, plausible. Yeah, so definitely plausible. Um, this is a great topic that, um, again, I think challenges all, all of us, including mm -hmm. the practitioners out there, because there's all, almost, C.S. Lewis always said that there's truth to every religion. Yes. This is sort of one of those things where there's like, and this is many of these myths, by the way, is there some truth um, in all of them? And many times that truth comes from research. It's just how that's interpreted. So in short, the really the big boost that I found was around 2015, there was a review article published that claimed benefits of glucomannan on weight loss, statistically significant. And um, that, that produced a lot of supplement production, a lot of marketing, a lot of campaigns, a lot of mm -hmm. products being uh, produced and sold. The problem was, uh, not long after that, the authors had to make some edits and retract some <laughs> things and actually came to say that it, it doesn't work relative to a placebo. So the true test for these is what we would call a randomized placebo-controlled trial, okay. right? Can you explain that yeah. really quickly to our listeners? I will. And it's important to know, I think if you're interested in this whole myth world, um, these are the type of studies that are ideal. Because what, what they did in this scenario as an example, they would randomize someone to either the fiber, the glucomannan, mm -hmm. or a placebo. The placebo being a substance that the people thought was glucomannan, okay. but it wasn't. Then they can measure things like you're saying, satiety, weight loss, hormones, or whatever else they mm -hmm. wanted to measure. That's important because if you feed someone... Uh, if you don't have a placebo, then you don't necessarily know if it's the actual substance or just because they believe it's going to work. And the placebo effect is a real thing. So when they compare glucomannan to uh, this back in that 2015 study mm -hmm. with the updates, it was really no different. So when people thought it was fiber and it wasn't, it was really producing about the same effects. Fast forward to 2021, there was a new review article that's come out of ran these randomized placebo-controlled trials and also found a statistically significant difference. What that means is the, the weight loss between the placebo and the glucomannan groups were different. We're, we're confident mm -hmm. they're different. As you know, that's what statistical yeah. significance tells us. The problem is, it's not a problem. The truth is, in both of those reviews, the clinical or applied significance was not there. The effect was not there. The easiest way to explain that uh, for me is if you put somebody through and all these studies were somewhere about between five and 52 weeks, giving them, let's say, somewhere between half a gram to five or six grams of glucomannan per day. Okay. A big range. It's a big range. So what you end up doing is when you look at all those studies and sort of average them, it was a loss in favor of the glucomannan of about one kilogram. So about two pounds, yeah. it's 2.2 pounds, mm -hmm. over 52 weeks, let's say. So statistically, yeah. yes, we're confident that it's about a 1, 1 1.2 or whatever kilogram mm -hmm. difference. That's statistical significance. But as a clinician or a practitioner, yeah, but it's one kilogram. So, and is that any better than just eating a healthy diet or exercising a bit more or, you know what I mean, like in comparison yeah. to other things? So that's what ended up happening, and the research generally has shown, is that there could be something there, and there's probably individuals who respond differently. But at the end of the day, uh, the, the effect on people and weight loss is not going to be much at all. Okay. So really, it's no different than just having regular fiber in your diet, potentially. Well, I don't know, right? So I think that's a good question. You know, would there be a difference if you know, I took the five grams of the supplement or I just ate an apple? You know, or the yam itself? 
or or the yam itself, right? Okay. Uh, or some Brussels sprouts or mm -hmm. whatever else, some beans, right? That mm -hmm. would be probably triple that in the amount of fiber. Um, and what if I consumed the whole diet that was full of fiber for, versus just adding five grams of fiber? Okay, yeah. You know what I mean? So th there's those variables. Uh, you did ask a question early on about uh, satiety and mm -hmm. difference in feelings. There have been studies on that too, and the placebo can actually make people feel full. So there's this interesting mm -hmm. phenomenon that if I think I'm eating more fiber, all of a sudden I feel more full. They actually did a study on flatulence too, <laughs> but <laughs> and that they, the placebo, they thought they were flatulating more than they were in any of the fiber groups. So and that's not glucoman and that's just fiber. So yeah, they've looked at all those things and there's this real challenge with these sort of supplements related to fiber. Um, personal experience with people I know and people I've worked with, people just have very different responses to fiber. So uh, there in the 1920s, there was a diet called the Hollywood diet. Yes, I remember this. Yeah, so they would promote, uh, and it's come back around a few times, but the original was uh, before you ate, at a minimal, you ate half a grapefruit. Okay. This is what the Hollywood mm -hmm. stars did in the 20s, I yep. guess. Uh, if not, you ate a half a grapefruit, some Melba toast, you remember that? Okay, yep. And a boiled egg before you ate. Sounds delicious. Yes. <laughs> so it was like a preload. Yeah. You know, in our, our, our world, we yeah. talk about preloads all mm -hmm. the time. That's sort of what happened. If I could eat something that's high fiber or some fiber, even five grams maybe, then I'm less hungry. Some people that's going to have more of an effect on than, mm -hmm. than others, uh, at least in my experience. So it may work better. Yeah. in others. So I, I don't want to make a global claim that this stuff is fiber is yeah. worthless or any of that. I do, when people consider fiber, you know, the, the tremendous health benefits from a, a diet full of fiber is really where the focus should be. And then any of the weight loss benefits will come as it relates to those health benefits rather than just depending on a supplement. And then let's say eating a terrible diet, but I'm taking five grams of a fiber yeah. Metamucil or anything else. So for our listeners out there that are interested in potentially improving or increasing the amount of fiber, mm -hmm. wh what are good sources of fiber? And really, how do we know if we're getting enough? Because I know that Americans typically, we, we don't even scratch the surface in a typical American diet for getting enough fiber, yes. I believe. Yeah, you are correct. So the uh, commercially, as we call it, a commercially mm -hmm. refined uh, and processed standard American diet or crap said. Um, <laughs> is is generally very low in fiber. And so let's say something like 10 grams per day, okay. maybe 15 grams per day. The general recommendations, and it does, by the way, vary by age, sex, weight, any other okay. conditions somebody might have, you know, need to visit with their doctor about. But generally, uh, 25 to 35 grams per day. I have seen upwards of quite strong benefits from cultures who eat 45, 50 grams okay. per day. Yeah. Um, many Americans would probably need to work up to that. Um, so that, that's the general recommendation, 25 to 35 grams per day. Now, what would that even look like? So I made a note. I wrote down kind of based on okay. what I'm sort of eating right now. So no judgment. So <laughs> breakfast, let's say you had one cup of cooked oatmeal. Okay. So that would be like half a cup dry. Yep. So that's four grams of fiber. All right. Okay, just oats. I add a lot of walnuts to my oatmeal, so I add about half a cup okay. of walnuts. That's another four grams right. of fiber. Then the snack, I've been all over pumpkin seeds recently, okay. probably since the fall, I guess. It's pumpkin spice latte time. <laughs> See, yeah, definitely not that. The, uh, the um, milkshakes disguises coffee. But yes. um, <laughs> one third a cup of pumpkin seeds so a third a okay. cup, not much, not is much. seven grams of oh, fiber. All right. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And so I devour a third a cup easily. So lunch and dinner combined. Let's say throughout those two meals, I had a cup of black beans. Okay. Either in one or across both. That's 15 grams of fiber, black beans, cooked a cup of cooked collard beans. Do you like col or collard greens? Do you like I love col collard greens. All right. This is good for you. So that's seven to eight grams. Okay. One cup. So I'm at 37, 38, somewhere? 30, like that? oh, that's pretty good. Okay. I had to write it down <laughs> <laughs> and add it up on my phone. Yeah, so 37 to 38 grams. So again, let's say a general, a typical female, let's say would have a recommendation of 25 grams. Okay. 
where there you go, that you are in a man or a, a higher weight or someone else gets prescribed 35 grams. So what I just listed off, the sources would be, as you would imagine, vegetables, yep. fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, seeds. Um, those are going to be the main sources. You can go on the Internet and find the exact fiber of whatever amount of anything that you want. The goal is just how do you can start combining those, as I did here in this example, from breakfast to through snacks, through lunch, dinner, and so on, that that could total up. So think about someone who is eating a standard American diet, 10 grams of fiber per day, 15 grams of fiber, mm -hmm. and they add five more grams of a fiber supplement. So they get 15, 20, let's say 20 yeah. grams. Versus this, what we just added up, I didn't add any fiber supplementation. I was able to consume it with whole food and get quite a bit more. Yeah plus all the nutritional benefits that the fiber alone doesn't have, a supplement. Plus, I get the same satiety. Mm -hmm. I get the same other benefits. And if I was going for weight loss, I could receive those as well, plus all the health benefits. Yeah. So really, it's kind of coming back to what you were talking about at the beginning about all these fad diets and people thinking something isn't working for them. We could just get back to maybe just healthy eating. That could resolve a lot of it. I think so. I mean, in a, in a lot of ways, that's what we recommend. Yeah. We always hope people to do. Clearly, that's a challenge. Yes. And it's very difficult and more difficult for some than others to adopt that sort of mm -hmm. lifestyle. Even what we just listed out there, there may be fun, some listening there like, yeah, there's no way. Yeah. Or I don't like any of that. So it'd be this process of finding what they do like, whole grains, for example. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some, some more whole grains that they would like. With those challenges, it's very easy for us, I think, to be attracted to the shiny lights of some quick fix or something that's being promoted. So I usually promote an optical, optimal, or a sort of optimistic type of skepticism as mm -hmm. it relates to anything, um, and then um, do the due diligence of looking in. Most of these things, like you said, are coming back to some basic concepts. Yes. Uh, for example, this works because it reduces caloric intake. Cut out any macronutrient, it's going to reduce caloric yeah. intake. Or... It might, um, so people have asked me, what about this vigorous exercise routine? Um, whatever's popular yeah. one of the day, you know? And will it work for, let's say, weight line? I'm like, yeah, it'll work. Because it's vigorous exercise, yeah. not necessarily because it's unique in any. And so if you like it. Go for it. Do it. Yeah. People ask, uh, is it better to work out in the morning or at night? Mm. And you could, you could get into the hormonal responses. Mm -hmm. It does differ. If, particularly if somebody's on an empty stomach or full stomach, like you mm -hmm. can get into the weeds. But I always ask, well, which one would you do? Mm -hmm. Like, well, definitely not morning because I'm not a morning person. And this, well, then evening is the best time to work out for you. <laughs> so sometimes it is the simple thing, doing our best to make our way and progressing toward a healthier diet, uh, more physical activity or what it, what it might be. And to the practitioners who are listening, um, generally my take home message for them is, is do the work is dig in, look at the, find the original study, read it, see what it actually found, and you interpret it. And then whether or not it aligns with the media article that you saw, the, the social media post, or the, the, the supplement uh, marketing itself, then you can make that judgment. But if you're working with patients and clients, you be that reputable source that stands between and you may find, sure enough, that this supplement that's more, they're right on. Yeah. They're not, it's, it's perfect. It's, they're doing the right thing. But you may find that it's not. And being that buffer, but it means the skill set of being able to find research, read it, understand it, assimilate it, and then be able to relay it in a way that the client patients understand it um, is a very, very important skill set, which mm -hmm. you'd get in my class. But <laughs> it's, if you don't even take the class, work on that, practice yeah. that. And I think that's a strong take-home message for me to any practitioners or clinicians who would be, be listening. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ferris, for the take-home message and for explaining fiber and all the other details. Again, if you are interested in his website, it's fitnesspudding.com. And if you have any feedback or any topics you would really like to hear, um, please just email us at huffines at tamu.edu.